Well greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's big video which is dwarfed by the size of the box that contains our challenge okay for this video uh, I'm guessing it's either a Fender Super 6 or maybe a Champ chassis okay so let's uh, quit uh, gabbing and get out the old box cutter and see what our challenge is for the rest of the week other than the sarcophagus of King Tut, I can't imagine what would require such a massive box. Okay, so let's uh, excavate inward through layers of antiquity. Good heavens. Okay, uh, oh, well, I'm going to put the camera down and use two hands on this, okay? Uh, I'll be right back. Well, after three hours of excavation, uh, I found that there was a inner box, uh, and with the help of my um, engine hoist, I was able to get it up here onto the workbench. So uh, let's get out our trusty uh, blade and see what our big surprise is. Okay, looks like we have our letter here that we will refer to in just a few minutes and now more excavation well after unwrapping about three hectares of bluish foam we see finally our mission uh, awaiting us here on the workbench uh, it is a blackface fender basement amp with tubes packed separately and the aforementioned letter okay so let's get all this packing material out of the way and get started on our amp. Well sure enough um, Fender Baseman, a uh, beautiful control panel and something here that was noted in a previous video the CSA test, the Canadian safety test uh, a bunch of viewers uh, remarked that that's what this means so apparently the amp was either um, headed for Canada, sold in Canada, although that's not where it came from to me. Uh, this one originated in Ohio, okay. Uh, so uh, we look it over and as have been so many of the amps I've received lately, this thing is an absolutely mint, unmolested original condition. Almost museum grade, okay. This, uh, the internal part here where the circuit is could just about pass for new control panel is wonderful a little dusty let's flip it over and take a look at the uh, tube side and here we see the traditional massive fender uh, transformers including the output transformer which is probably a little bulkier than the power transformer um, one thing I notice here is a lot of discoloration on the surface of the amp. Bear in mind this you know hangs upside down so the heat and everything else would have been uh, rising the cabinet up to this point. I suspect when I see it being real yellowish like this that it may have been used in a, a bar or someplace with a lot of cigarette smoke. Um, okay uh, also some pretty hot uh, output to bias would be my guess. Um, We'll see, of course, when we get started on this, but original transformers. Uh, let's open up the doghouse. You know darn well what we're going to find there. Okay, four Phillips head screws removed. It's still stuck to the Minimite uh, capacitors. The Astrons are uh, present and accounted for with hernias on uh, four of the six. Okay, so no doubt we'll be replacing those jewels and uh, checking our, our resistors here for a power supply. Okay, looks very straightforward to me and wonderfully unmolested. Let's open our letter and see uh, what our assignment is. Okay, here's our letter. A 65 baseman he just received from a neighbor. Good Lord, he has better neighbors than I do. All I get from my neighbors is a lot of grief and restraining orders. Okay, here, um, no history on the app. It is a mystery. That rhymes nicely. 
um, check it all out keep it as original as possible oh my lord it has a 65 2 by 12 cab with vintage JBLs oh good heavens you know this is just gonna sound terrible I think maybe he better just leave it here and not even have me send it back uh, but let's see thank you very much blah 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 so really we don't know uh, what's wrong with it whether it works or not uh, you know it worked at one time that's the one thing that always keeps me sort of energized when I'm working on an amp is uh, after about 17 hours of just mind-boggling work and frustration is the idea that hey it worked at one time in the past um, so with not a lot to go on other than uh, we need to go knock on some neighbors doors later and see if they have any blackface fenders for us uh, let's go ahead and get started with uh, the restoration of this really fabulous um, time capsule fender amp step one let's determine the year of origin for this amplifier chassis uh, the owner said 1965 and no doubt he's correct let's also try to track down an accurate schematic uh, first we have to determine which circuit it is and we know that there are a bunch of different basement circuits okay so uh, one clue to the identity of the circuit is the presence of this 8 microfarad electrolytic cap in the doghouse this is unusual and as far as I recall is, is uh, typical of only uh, maybe two of all the different basement schematics okay uh, so uh, give me a little time I'm gonna go in the house and using the serial number on the chassis and uh, other peculiarities here in the circuit will try to identify which one it is and get an accurate schematic alright I'm back and using the serial number that's stamped into the chassis uh, and doing a little interpolation on the spread of um, chassis numbers for each year it is indeed from 1965 and because this is a fairly early number I'm going to guess it was made between February and maybe March in that year of 1960 and we'll see that in the year 1965 Fender offered three different versions of the circuit in their basement amps now the earliest is the double A 864 and that's really the gold standard that's the ultimate of all uh, blackface basement circuits that's the one that when people say oh, I'm gonna blackface my basement this is the one that they emulate okay there's two other versions so however that are available at this time double A 165 and the AB 165 now let's take a look at uh, the uh, three different schematics uh, and see if we can figure out uh, when these changes were made and what those changes are first we see the double A 864 now for some reason Fender uses a letter code it's it's just uh, childishly simple why they do this I'm not sure but H would be what the eighth month it's the eighth letter of the alphabet so August of 64 is when this circuit was developed okay then we see that in January of 1965 they went to the double A 165 circuit and shortly thereafter uh, that would be what uh, ABCD for uh, April of 65 they went to the AB 165 circuit okay so the double A only really existed for about three or four months okay which makes the double A rather unusual that doesn't mean that it has great value or, or collector um, appeal or anything like that but one thing you should keep in mind is when you see a short-lived uh, circuit generally it's for a reason maybe something 
happened with this one that they thought, you know, we better go back and, and make some change. Now at this point, we don't know which one of these circuits we have here. But like I said, this is a major clue, okay, the 8 microfarad electrolytic. And here's why. First off, we have our fingers crossed that we have a AA 864. And we see that we have one, two, three twenties, and that's it. Nothing else. So we can rule out AA 864. Let's look at AA 165. And we have one, two, three twenties, and lo and behold, there is the eight. Okay, so as it stands, this may be a AA 165. Let's go to the AB. Okay, I see one, two, three, and an eight. So I feel right now pretty certain that we either have a AA 165 or an AB 165. Now to differentiate between those two, let's look at uh, a rather peculiar difference between the two. Uh, the AA has a potentiometer that is used to adjust overall bias for both of the 606 GCs. Okay, we see here that we're dialing in our negative DC uh, voltage to be applied equally to the two grids of the 6L6s. What's different here is when we go to the AB, we have a pot in exactly the same position, but in this case, you have two separate outputs. This one goes to the grid of the lower tube. This one is adjustable and goes to the grid of the upper tube. This is a balance uh, control. We can balance our 6L6s uh, rather than control the overall bias to both of them. So what we'll need to do is look at the pot that is in our chassis and see whether it is a balance control or an overall bias control. A concerned viewer sent me this lovely pointer here which consists of a severed bloody finger uh, at the end of a probably more uh, appropriate pointer. But anyway, I'm going to use this right now and we'll see how uh, which of the two types of pot we have present here in this chassis. And we see that the wiper, always in the middle, comes out here and goes to, it comes up here to this point, and then it goes to two 220K resistors. Let's look over here at the AA, and lo and behold, the AA, the output from the uh, wiper does go to two 220K resistors. Now let's look down here at the balance control, and the output from the wiper will go to a two, one 220K resistor and then a 1500 ohm grid blocker. We don't see that here. That's not what we have. So this is the rather unusual and elusive AA-165. Now, when people say they're going to blackface their baseman circuit, it is the AA-864 version that they are going to duplicate. They are not going to duplicate the AA-165 or the AB version. Therefore, one must wonder what it is about this earlier version that endears it so much to musicians that they want to convert their amp into this particular circuit. Now I thought that having this amplifier on hand might give us a great opportunity to perform an experiment and see if black facing, so to speak, um, is worth the trouble. Okay, so with the permission, in fact the encouragement of the owner of this particular amp, I am going to optimize the AA-165 circuit, do an audio demo, 
And then I'm going to go through the step-by-step -step process of converting it into a AA864 and then having a second audio demo. And I will create them uh, the demo side by side, A, B, A, B, A, B, so that you can hear this version, then this version, and so on for direct comparison. Okay, so let's see once and for all, is it really worth the trouble to blackface a uh, non AA864 Fender circuit? Step one will be the optimization of the circuit that we have on hand, the AA165 that was sent to us by the customer. That will be all of the electrolytics, uh, testing uh, all the resistors, capacitors, tubes, things of that sort to make sure that it sounds the best that it can Okay, before we convert it into the much more popular and desirable circuit uh, and then we'll have our side-by-side -side comparison. Okay, so let's get started on the optimization of our AA165. Before I get started on the optimization, I just wanted to say to the purists out there who are cringing at the thought of altering the circuit, uh, a four-month uh, duration circuit, and changing it to something else, I will save every single original component that is removed, even the bad capacitors, so that in the future, if need be, the black-faced version of this circuit can be restored back to originality, okay, with every single uh, original component. Okay, so I, I just hope that puts your mind at ease. I've asked Mitzi's opinion of it and she says this sounds like a neat experiment so without further ado uh, let's get started on our optimization this big heavy package arrived from a viewer it's obviously a gift but I wanted to show you how they decorated the entire box I mean this person is quite artistic let me show you all the different sides of the box give you an idea of just how much uh, detail he went into to decorate it. I guess that's Rusty celebrating beef jerky, wrenches hanging on the wall in the workshop. Looks like a barn door. Box bottom, other side up. Here we have a birdhouse, Uncle Doug Tweet, stockpile of old leaky capacitors, is Ollie home, we got a little mouse here hanging on a ring of some sort. Then on the final side, just a bunch of shingles. What do you think of that, Casey? She's obviously deeply moved. Okay, so we've checked out all the embellishment. Let's see what the contents are. I noticed down here a little dog bone uh, name tag, Rusty, on the pup. Boy, this thing's a nightmare to open. I've cut all the seams and this side pulls back, but there's all sorts of brass staples in here holding the cardboard down to a wood frame. Okay, so I, let me pry all those staples out. Well, I finally just had to take a razor blade and cut the top off the box. Okay, because there is a uh, wood frame in here that uh, makes it really tough to open. And I found this invoice and uh, all kinds of items in here, but uh, apparently I'm not being billed anything. That's good. I'd hate to owe like eight or nine hundred dollars for this gift. But anyway, let's uh, continue the opening procedure. We get the foam out of the way. We've got a bunch of uh, items. I'll have to open this to see. Nice pair of work gloves. Well, I remember from my teaching days that this is a, these are dry erase markers a dry erase uh, board cleaning fluid 
and what looks like an eraser, a bunch of screws. Maybe when we see what's in the box, this will all make sense. Well, the mystery thickens because I get it open here and it's like a mirrored surface. I don't know, I think that's mirrored plexiglass with hinges at the end. Let me get this out of here. Looks like a clasp. Get this out of here and let's see if we can figure out what this is. This appears to be a giant loose leaf notebook with metal covers and let's see oh my god it contains every single fender schematic apparently ever made they're blown up and they're laminated that's what the dry markers are for is for writing on the lamination and then erasing it so you can make modifications and things like that oh my god this is fantastic I've never seen anything like this what a, a bunch of work and really neat well I'll tell you I, I'm completely in awe between the artwork on the box and this incredibly useful compendium of fender schematics Wow, this is just fantastic. I really appreciate this. I just had to share this with you on the uh, rear part of the binder on the inside. Got the masking tape, of course, it says in dedication to Lupe Lopez. We got the all important Underwriter Laboratories um, symbol there, which makes us know this is safe. And up here, there's a pilot light. And we have a little uh, battery-operated LED to insert into the pilot light so that um, this giant folding loose-leaf book uh, has pretty much everything that an old Fender Tweed amp would have. Okay, making it truly wonderful and official. This is really clever. Um, here on the back, the binding, where you would carry the big notebook, um, there's an original Fender leather handle with the clips and a pilot light that will be illuminated from inside by that little LED battery unit that came with it. It's just everywhere you look there's something neat. And all I can say is Richard, thanks so much. Uh, I promise you it's going to get a lot of use and I really do appreciate your generosity and thoughtfulness. All right, I've ordered and received all the components necessary for the conversion as well as the recapping of the AA-165 uh, circuit. I have my 320 at 500 F and T's to replace these um, three Astrons. Um, I have a pair of the 70 microfarad at 350 mods to replace the reservoir capacitor here that's in series and I have the uh, 10 microfarad at 500 F and T to replace that unusual uh, fourth uh, electrolytic capacitor uh, in the uh, power rail that we see on the AA-165 circuit. Well, as you can see, all of the electrolytics have been replaced in the doghouse uh, with brand new F and T and mod capacitors. I also uh, measured the resistance of the three internodal resistors, the originals, and they were all out of spec. So I replaced all three of them with metal oxide resistors of appropriate uh, value. Now that the power supply has been uh, completely restored, we can put the cover back on the doghouse, flip over the chassis, and start to address the uh, cathode bypass caps and other components uh, within the chassis. Well, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different cathode bypass caps. Uh, all are 25 at 25 volts, but I'm going to replace them with 25 at 50 volts just to play it safe. Here's a little tip whenever you're replacing your cathode bypass caps, uh, when you remove them, you will expose the cathode bias resistor.
and just like the bias of your output tubes uh, you want to be sure that each of your preamp tubes is properly biased so you really should measure the value of the uh, bias resistor and make sure that it is really close to uh, what the value should be in this case we're looking at 1.5 K which is brown green red and we see that the value is really close to uh, being right on it was probably that close when the amp was new okay so this resistor has not really been subject to a lot of current and therefore has not drifted so we'll leave it in place and go ahead and measure the other bias resistors as we replace the bypass caps the cathode bypass caps have all been wired in with proper polarity and now it's time to address the three wire power cord and also the switchable NFB loop which uh, is a modification I make on virtually every Fender amplifier that I work on so let's start off first with our three wire power cord the three wire power cord has been installed and the green wire now is securely grounding the chassis the uh, original polarity switch has been converted to an NFB on off switch uh, as I've shown in previous videos uh, now I think about the only thing left that we need to do is to check out the screen resistors and uh, grid blocker resistors on the two output tubes and then I think we're ready to do an audio check on the amplifier in its original AA 165 form all right uh, as we stand the entire circuit has received all new electrolytic capacitors had every out-of-spec resistor replaced three wire power cord switchable NFB uh, the uh, screen and uh, grid uh, blocker resistors have been replaced and one last thing that kind of makes me nervous is that the original two amp fuse has been blown now that could be due to those really really lousy looking electrolytic uh, filter caps uh, but just for the heck of it I'm gonna go ahead and check for any shorts in the output transformer or power transformer before we continue well the output transformer checked out okay you can see the resistance of each of the half windings uh, the power transformer had no short circuits that I could detect so I think the fuse probably blow, blew because of the uh, leaky electrolytics so I think we're safe to continue and of course we're going to use our current limiter um, anytime that the amp is plugged in just to uh, prevent a surge of current that might damage some of the uh, components in the circuit all right we're plugged into the voltage limiter and uh, I have turned on the amp with no tubes in place and the high voltage is present uh, I found out that the pilot light was burned out so I installed a brand new one and as you can see it shines brightly so uh, we're slowly working our way through here to make sure that the voltages are present at each of the two bases and uh, there are obviously no shorts you see that the light is not illuminated in the current limiter so so far so good I'll continue and alert you whenever I find anything worth mentioning next step that is important is to determine that the grid bias the negative DC that is applied by the uh, bias supply down here um, is present on the grids we definitely need that negative DC bias supply to uh, keep our tubes from self-destructing uh, and we see that sure enough it's around a negative 50 volts and we see that the suggested amount is negative 45 volts so we're right in the ballpark uh, and this is the adjustment to run that negative bias up and down I'm gonna turn the uh, bias pot with the screwdriver and you see I'm gonna set it at the 45 that the schematic recommends and we'll sort from there and uh, put in our uh, six uh, L6 GC power tubes 
and start checking the bias. Okay, uh, now it's time to install the tube set that came with the amp. I'm going to unwrap them, install them in the proper sockets, and uh, I will install my Eurotubes bias probe uh, sensors here in between the 606 and the socket so that we can check the um, plate voltage and plate current and calculate our plate dissipation. Okay, so uh, I'll be right back with the tubes installed. Although the tube set is just a fabulous set of vintage RCA and Westinghouse tubes, uh, much to my revulsion, the base of each of the tubes has been slathered with what looks like white grease. Um, I don't know if that was to seal the air from the contact points with a socket, but you know darn well it prevents the contact. Uh, between the two pins and the socket, so uh, the pins uh, are having to be cleaned uh, very thoroughly and the socket before I can uh, insert each tube. To clean the pins and the socket I use lacquer thinner with a small brush, uh, brushed around the socket, let the lacquer thinner run down each of the passages, I put a, a paper towel under the chassis to catch the dripping um, lacquer thinner. Then I immersed just the pins and used a toothbrush to clean the pins, uh, not getting the lacquer thinner up here to eliminate the uh, markings on the tube. Okay, so uh, I think we're ready now to fire it up, hopefully not literally, and uh, you see that I have the Eurotubes uh, probes in place. Uh, let's turn it on and see what happens, okay? Donning our uh, smoke um, mask and a fire retardant suit. Okay, I plugged into the current limiter. Eurotubes probes ready to go. I connected to the uh, 8 ohm shop speaker um, and uh, I am inputting a 200 cycle per second tone from the audio generator. Okay, so let's switch on the power. Let it warm up for a minute or so and then we'll uh, take it off standby. We see our lovely new pilot light is glowing beautifully. What we don't see, however, is any sort of illumination, play voltage or current arising in our second 6L6. The current limiter light is not illuminating or generating heat so we're not drawing a great deal of current right now which is nice but uh, I think we have uh, one bad tube. Okay I reversed the tubes and the uh, tube in this right hand socket did not illuminate although it illuminated just fine on the left in the left hand socket Apparently we have some serious issue right here uh, with this tube socket. Perhaps uh, it isn't a short, I don't think, but there's some sort of uh, major issue. So uh, let's disconnect uh, the uh, chassis and circuit and flip this over and see if we can figure out what it is. Well, the solution to the non-illuminating 6L6 that was in this socket is apparent right here when you see that after I fished around a little bit here in the filament wiring that one of the two 6.3 uh, volt filament wires has been disconnected. Okay, I don't know if that was in uh, transport. Sometimes when people pack these up, the packing material penetrates into the back of the chassis and uh, can move wires and, and break connections. But uh, whatever the reason, uh, we'll resolder this wire and then all the rest of our tubes will be able to uh, have their filaments energized. While I'm at it now, I want to test the two 6L6s to be sure that they're uh, both in good shape. Well, I plugged the first of the two 6L6s into the trusty Hickok model 600A. It's all warmed up and uh, let's see what kind of emission it has and it is absolutely pitiful. What is it? Down around 600? Okay, that's pretty sad. Uh, so this tube is just worn out. The cathode is thoroughly depleted so it will have to be replaced. Now we'll check the other two. And now our second 6L6 despite being pitifully weak, also has the added feature 
of a dead short uh, as you can see by the short indicator light being illuminated <clears throat> so both tubes are too weak one has a dead short I think it's time to go in the house and order a new matched pair of 6L6GC's since the two uh, 6L6's were bad I thought well might as well check the 12AX7's and the 12AT7 and sure enough one of the 12AX7's tests out to be kind of marginal okay all the rest of them were up here uh, in the 2000 to 2500 or even higher range so this one just is just kind of on the cusp of not being any good and um, I have a nice vintage 12AX7's uh, in my uh, tube stash so I'm going to substitute one of them for this sort of aging and weak tube here's that replacement vintage uh, 12AX7 and as you can see its output is much stronger okay then that old tube so uh, once we get our two uh, our mass pair of 6L6's we'll have our complete tube set and we'll be ready to proceed just to give you an idea of how nasty those tube bases were with all that white grease that's the residue from cleaning the tubes themselves and this is from cleaning the sockets okay now as you can see they look nice and shiny and clean and so do the tube bases Here's Mitzi in her new favorite roosting spot uh, during the day on the roof of the little 1929 Model A Roadster. She seems very happy up here. Uh, I guess she feels safe because it's up high. Uh, she's sinking slowly in with my very expensive top here, uh, which will soon reach the dashboard probably. But I guess that's the price of having feral kitties. Well, the new 6L6 GCs arrived really quickly from Antique Electronics Supply. Uh, as you all know, it's tough buying uh, modern tubes nowadays. Um, these looked really good. Uh, I've always kind of liked the Tube Amp Doctor, and uh, we got a, I believe, a nice match pair. We'll see. I notice they have red bases, and they sure look good. So I've got them all plugged in here uh, with the uh, Eurotubes biasing probes. Uh, let's turn on our amp and adjust the bias and see how well balanced the tubes are. Okay, I just switched off a standby. Oh, and as you can see, the bias is set quite low now, which is always a good idea when you're uh, trying out a new set of tubes. Okay, so uh, looks like they're nicely matched. Let's go in and adjust our bias adjustment here. Wrong way. What do you think? We're going to go up to what, uh, let's see, 50, 40, what do we want, about 48? Yeah, as you can see, we've got about somewhere around 20 watts of plate dissipation, which sounds about right, 70% of 30. Um, and I always go a little bit conservatively. Okay, we'll crank up the volume. There's still a tiny bit of scratchiness uh, in the volume control. It was terrible when I first uh, tested the amp. Um, I've cleaned it twice. And I'm going to give you a little tip. If after a thorough cleaning, your volume control still uh, is scratchy when you wiggle it back and forth. Now that's, that's in pretty good shape right there, but if it's still scratchy, check the coupling capacitor that is shielding the volume control from the plate voltage, the DC plate voltage of the tube that is immediately prior to the volume control in the circuit. Of course that goes for both channels. Okay, let's switch our input over here to the uh, normal channel and see uh, if the controls are nice and quiet and if the circuit is responsive. Okay, we shifted down here to the normal channel, crank up the volume. Still a little scratchiness there right at the kind of initial 
point where the volume starts to increase. So I'm going to check the coupling cap that's protecting this uh, potentiometer here. The tone controls seem nice and quiet and responsive. So after checking that coupling cap, I think we're going to be ready to do our first audio test of the AA 165 circuit. And as you can see, the plate current's gone up a little bit as the tubes have warmed up. But we're looking at about, uh, what, 20.85 watts, which is right close to our 21 watt ideal 70% of max PD biasing. Well, unfortunately, there's probably three ways that DC from the plate of the uh, 7025 right here can get to both the treble and volume controls which are uh, sounding a little scratchy right now. Could be the 250 picofarad cap, the 0.1 microfarad cap here, or perhaps the 0.047. Now I doubt that it's this one because the base uh, adjustment is dead quiet. So uh, I pulled all three of them here you see that the downstream ends of all three of those capacitors are uh, disconnected from the circuit. So now uh, I can uh, test them to, uh, for the presence of DC. All right, let's start off with our little 250 picofarad uh, coupling cap here. Um, let's take the amp off standby. Let's watch our DC voltmeter and see if it responds to the presence of any direct current. Oh yeah, look at this. It's responding for sure. It's uh, 245 millivolts of DC and it's positive. Okay, so it would appear then that our 250 uh, pico uh, farad uh, capacitor is leaky. Let's try the point oh, uh, let's try the point oh four seven right next to it. Okay, here we are uh, coming off of standby. And that looks random to me. It's just jumping around. It can't really find anything to lock onto. Notice it's negative about half the time. So, uh, as predicted, I think the point, uh, 0.047 microfarad cap is fine. Let's move down here to the point 0.1. Now, it could be bad. Here we go off of standby. And what we're seeing, although it does tend to always be positive. No, there's negative. I don't think we've got an issue with the point 0.1. Let's go back to the 250 picofarad cap and double check. And sure enough, it is homing in on a value. 275 about a millivolts, always positive. So to me there's no doubt uh, the culprit is a little 250 picofarad uh, cap. I happen to have some in stock. I'm going to replace it. Here's that leaky little disc capacitor, and I have a really nice uh, silver mica 250 picofarad that I'm going to install. And there's our little uh, 250 picofarad silver mica cap, nicely soldered in place. Let's. Uh... Well, the first step of our experiment is completed. Uh, the volume control has quieted down since we replaced that uh, a leaky coupling cap, replaced the two output tubes, two preamp tubes, all of the electrolytic uh, capacitors, um, the power rail resistors, uh, three-wire power cord, fuse, pilot light, you name it, we've replaced it. So uh, I think now it's time to fire this jewel up and do our audio test of the optimized but original uh, AA 165 circuit. Well, the first audio demo is completed, and as I explained earlier, I'm not going to play it for you now because you have nothing to compare it to. 
I'm going to hold it for later and give you an A, B comparison between the tone of this circuit and the converted AA 864 circuit. I cannot resist telling you though that during the audio demo the normal channel knocked us out. It was dynamite. It's just what you expect from a blackface Fender uh, basement amp. The bass uh, channel however was very disappointing. Weak, uninspiring, it just it, it was kind of flat. We really didn't care for it. It'll be interesting to see if the modifications that are done to this circuit will address that issue. I honestly don't see how the normal channel could be improved very much, but I'm telling you the base channel really needs some help. So with that in mind, let's begin the conversion process from AA165 to AA864. Let's take a few moments uh, away from our video to discuss a product that was sent to me by a viewer for evaluation. You know I don't accept uh, any type of advertising but when people send me interesting items like this I like to share them with you. And what this is is extensions for your aerosol cans like so and these are connectors which allow you to construct uh, tubing of any sort of configuration that you might choose to reach into difficult areas. Okay, they come in two sizes, a .085 kit and a .110 kit. This would be larger diameter. And here's a bunch of extra uh, pieces of tubing. Okay, so uh, I thought this might be interesting. Those of us suffering with the deoxit um, nozzles and uh, dispensing systems. I thought this might be helpful. Okay, so uh, here is the contact data. Uh, you can uh, look on the internet uh, for more information from Aeroflex and this is the gentleman's name who sent them to me. So, if any of you find this interesting, please feel free to contact Mr. Mason and perhaps order some of these for yourself. Okay, first off, you'll be both glad and surprised to know that the normal channel on the two different versions is identical. Okay, also uh, the everything from the uh, phase inverter to the uh, output 606s, everything else is identical. Where the changes occur between the 165 and 864 version are all in the bass instrument channel and that makes sense to me because as I said uh, when we did the audio demo the bass instrument channel of the 165 form was really not all that usable it was obviously inferior to the normal input channel now to convert the 165 to the 864 form, there's about 13 changes that have to be made in the 165 circuit. And I've circled them, and where, wherever I have an X, that means that th this component will be eliminated. Okay, so we have one, two, three eliminations. We're reducing this capacitance to 250 picofarads. We're changing two of the pot values here in the tone control. Uh, we're going to uh, change a, a lot here in the uh, connection between the second uh, and third triodes. Uh, you can see that we have a value change there in elimination of these components and some other uh, mild modifications. Also an elimination here of the cathode bypass cap. So. Uh, like I said, about 13 changes, and uh, I've ordered the parts. I ordered some extras, okay, just to have on hand, but I ordered all the parts I needed to do this uh, with exactly the right values, so I think it's time to get started. Also, it should be noted that the transformers between the two forms of the circuit are identical, which is nice because I really would hate to start changing transformers on a nice original uh, chassis like this. 
First off will be the elimination of the 27K uh, nodal resistor. Uh, that extra 8 microfarad electrolytic cap and the uh, 0.01 microfarad bypass of the plate resistor for the first triode. And so our first step will involve the removal of this 165 specific 10 microfarad electrolytic cap that we just installed as well as the 27K metal oxide resistor that I uh, installed. In their place will be simply a jumper between this eyelet and this eyelet. Here we have the removed 10 microfarad electrolytic and the 27K resistor. Um, I also made a card here explaining the conversion, the date, and that I and Mitzi uh, performed of that modification. Okay, so let's close up the doghouse and move underneath for further modifications. Next we'll follow the yellow wire up here to the 100K plate resistor for pin 1 of the first triode and we'll remove the bypassing cap and here you see where we come up there's the 100K plate, res plate resistor to pin 1 and we're going to remove this 0.01 microfarad bypassing cap and that bypassing cap has now been removed. So let's round the bend here and start in on our tone stack modifications. First will be a 250 picofarad cap in, in place of the 500. And here it is and just to be sure I checked and it is approximately 500 picofarads. So we're going to remove this one and replace it with a 250. And there's our new uh, 250 silver mica cap. Now we go underneath and come over here and these are the wires that are going to connect up to the tone stack for that base channel. Okay, and that's where the modifications are going to uh, get rather extreme. So let's remove all three of the knobs and uh, see what uh, we've got to change. Step one will be the change of the treble pot from 250K audio taper to 50k audio taper. The three wires are removed from the 250k treble pot and now using my trusty nut twister we'll remove the treble pot. And there's the brand new 50k treble tone pot uh, completely installed. Before we move on to the bass tone control I just noticed there's a 220k resistor between the 250 picofarad cap and the treble control and you notice that it that does not exist on the 165 circuit so we've got to add a 220k resistor between the white wire and this lug of the tone pot all right there's the uh, new 220k resistor in series next we'll look over here at the base uh, tone control and see that it goes from 250k audio down to 10k. And I know that sounds like a tremendous difference but that's the way it is on the schematic. Okay so let's change that one. And we see that the 2.7k resistor goes with it uh, and it is here connected on the back so we'll leave it attached when we remove the pot. Out comes our original 250k base tone pot with the 2.7k resistor attached and in will go the, the new 10k base tone pot. Okay the new base potentiometer has been installed and is wired according to the AA864 schematic and also to the AA864 layout diagram. Okay, I've returned the three knobs uh, to their rightful positions on the three potentiometers. So now we're ready to proceed to the next portion of the circuit, which has to do with the third stage of amplification for the um, base instrument channel. And as we can see, there will be one, 
two, three, four, five, six deletions, uh, and then uh, it will be the circuit will be rewired back to A64 specifications with a much simpler input to that third triode. Let's start off removing the uh, 165 components. Now this is where things are going to start getting a little tricky. Okay, first we're going to have to find our landmark in the circuit itself uh, that corresponds to the schematic here and uh, here's how I'm going to find it. Here's my B plus comes up to 100k plate resistor to pin 6 of the second triode of the first amplification tube. There's pin 6. I'm going to come over here now. There is my 100k plate resistor. The B plus is right there. Okay, so yellow wire 100k resistor stay. But over here on the right side we have cap, what's that, 470k and cap. Let's see if we can find that uh, on the schematic. And sure enough, there's the 0.001 cap, 470k resistor, and there is our third cap that I pointed out, the larger red one. So from that point just to the left of the 0.001 cap, it's going to be here and down. That's going to be removed and rewired. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and remove these three components. And then uh, we will continue, because I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, uh, remove them, and then we'll move on and see what else has to go. Okay, so right here then, this coincides with the 864 schematic, so I'm going to leave it. But from that point to this point to this point, the A64 schematic is different. Okay, here are those three components. And it turns out this was a 0.047, so um, the third capacitor I moved was this one right here. So, so far we removed 0.001, 470K, 0.047. Next we'll hunt down the 0.22, the 1 meg, and the 4.7K and remove them. And it looks like Mitzi just showed up. She took a nice nap and she wants to come out and help us. Are you right, Mitzi? Stretch a little after that nap. Good girl. And here we see the 0.22, the 4.7K, and the 1 meg resistor. Okay, so these will be the next three components to be removed. And here are those final three components that had to be removed. The 0.22 microfarad cap, 1 meg resistor, 4.7K resistor, and we see them right here on the schematic, uh, 0.22, 1 meg, and 4.7K to ground. Those have been removed. Now, uh, if you see here, we have a nice empty space on our eyelet board, and we need to connect pin 6 of the second triode to pin 7 of the, thir of the third triode. Okay, so we're going to construct the circuit in here that matches the AA864 circuit connecting pin, pin 6 to pin 7. Now some of you are probably thinking, oh my lord, this is so complicated. Well, it is, and believe me, I get confused too. Uh, but what really helps is when you just boil it down to connecting pin 6 to pin 7, and we've got to construct the circuit. If you can sort of break down the task into logical steps, uh, it sure makes it less overwhelming. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to construct the 864 circuit right here that will connect this point to this point. Step one will be the uh, 0.1 microfarad cap and it will go from the sixth lug of uh, the second triode down here to this eyelet. Now I used my ohmmeter to see if any of the eyelets were connected and these two are connected and the way you can show that is to draw a line to remind you that uh, if you put a component between here and here it would be shorted. Okay, so hopefully we can use this connection uh, in our new circuit. But for now I'm going to 
solder in my 0.1 microfarad cap from here to here. The capacitor is now soldered in and uh, next from that 0.1 microfarad cap we're going to want a 220K resistor to pin 7 and a 220K resistor to ground. Here we see the two newly added 220K resistors. This one connecting the end of the 0.1 microfarad cap to pin 7 of the third triode and then the uh, second 220K resistor in series with the first but connected to ground. And now the final step in our modification of the connection between the second and third triodes will be the installation of a 0.001 microfarad cap in parallel with the second 220K resistor. And here we see that uh, here is our second 220K resistor and we have a 0.001 microfarad cap in parallel with it. Okay, so that completes uh, this modification here between the second and third triode. Now let's double check our wiring to make sure that it's correct. We come from pin 4 of the second triode through a 0.1 microfarad cap through a 220K resistor into pin 7 of the third triode. Here we go. We're coming in from pin 4 of the uh, T2, which is the second triode, through 0.1 microfarads, through 220K ohms, and we're going into pin 7 of the uh, third triode. Next, we have connected to the end of the first 220K resistor a second one that goes to ground. Okay, so here we'll connect a second 220K resistor from the end of the first one over here to ground. As you can see, this wire connects to this uh, little uh, eyelet here and grounds all of these components. Then finally, we see we have a little 0.001 microfarad cap that is between the midpoint of the two 220K resistors and ground. And sure enough, here it is. There's the midpoint of the two 220K resistors and our 0.001 microfarad cap goes from that midpoint over here to the ground eyelet. Which brings us to the final step in our conversion of this uh, circuit to the AA 864 uh, configuration and that is the removal of the uh, cathode bypass cap on the third triode. We see here that there is no cathode bypass cap for the 864 circuit. And here you see that I have indeed unsoldered and removed the cathode bypass cap that I just installed while uh, upgrading the AA-165 circuit. Now it's time to install the tube set and test our newly created AA-864 circuit to make sure that it's operating properly uh, at which time then we'll be ready for our second audio evaluation. Since the normal channel was not affected by our modifications, let's hear four tunes through that normal channel for both the AA 165 and 864 circuits to see what we think of it.
Now for the modified AA864 base channel evaluation, all tone and volume settings will be identical to those used for the optimized AA165 base channel. You will now hear the AB base channel comparison of five tunes. First will be the AA165 version, then the AA864 version of the same tune.
Now one obvious explanation for why the AA-165 tone seems so weak and kind of tinny is look at the comparison of gain by the 165 channel versus the 864 channel. It's uh, the 165 puts out a weaker signal. It's very obvious. Okay, so um, that leads me to think that since volume definitely affects our perception of tone, why not amplify a couple of the 165 tunes up to where they're at the same overall amplification level as the 864 tunes and then see about an AB comparison. If just simply uh, increasing the amplification here, which you could accomplish by just turning up the volume control a little higher, will that give you tone that is as good or better than the 864? Let's see. All right, here we have a couple tunes. Here is the 165 version, and I have boosted the overall gain to where it is equivalent to the 864 tune. Here's 165 overall amplification, about equal to the 864. Now let's do an AB comparison between the uh, in augmented 165 and the original 864 bass channel. I can't help but share a couple observations here. Uh, naturally, you can draw your own conclusions, but I just thought I'd tell you my own. Number one, I think this the spectrum here tells you a great deal. It looks to me like uh, you're losing a lot of your mid-range and bass frequencies with the 165 circuit. If anything, however, you may get too much bass and mid-range with the 864 circuit. Amplifying the 165 really did not compensate. This is a warmer, fuller tone, but I think that the 864 uh, tone would benefit from uh, some enhanced treble 
it needs to be uh, cleaned up a little bit, a little clearer. In fact, you might just be able to turn up the treble uh, tone control and end up with excellent tone with the 864. However, I don't think much that you can do, uh, including cranking up the volume, is going to help the 165 circuit. To me, this one isn't perfect, the 864, but it's uh, fixable, easily fixable, and it's much closer to what we expect from a Fender Bassman than this rather weak, uh, tinny sounding uh, tone that we're getting from the 165. Well, I guess that's about it for this epic video featuring the conversion of the AA 165 circuit into the much more desirable AA 864. As my trusty assistant uh, takes a nap here after the exhausting process of doing this conversion, I just wanted to take a few moments to thank all my PayPal contributors and Patreon patrons for their continued very generous support of our channel. If you would like to join them in supporting us, uh, please uh, see the links in the video description. I hope that the video was clear and easy to understand with adequate explanation uh, for each of the procedures that I demonstrated. I intend to keep the amp for a few more days uh, and experiment uh, with uh, minor improvements to tone if any are possible. So until our next video get together, uh, I want to wish you all uh, good health and happiness and a very happy new year. We'll see you uh, hopefully in the near future. Bye from Mitzi and your old uncle.